Radio Westeros, episode 68, We Three Kings. Spoilers all books! Hello and welcome to another episode of Radio Westeros. I'm Lady Guinevere and with me today, as ever, is Yoke Boy. Yeah, hi there everyone and thanks so much for joining us. We have a packed episode this time as we're doing a deep dive into the reigns of the last three Targaryen kings. Aegon V, Jaehaerys II and Aerys II. Yeah, we all know about Aegon V, the unlikely king who first crossed our pages as Egg, the equally unlikely sidekick to the hedge knight Sir Duncan the Tall. The story of how he became king and the decline of House Targaryen under his descendants is both fascinating and informative of many things we encounter in the main series. Yeah, we're going to look at each of their reigns and the major events that occurred while keeping our focus on dragon dreams, prophecies and the Blackfire issue and how all of these things combined to affect each reign in turn. And one thing to note, when we get to Ares II, we will be skirting over some major events while maintaining our focus on those themes, because we plan to bring you a dedicated episode all about the year of the fall spring later this year that will cover the events of the year 281 and the War of the Usurper. And so we'll begin today with a short segment called Why Three Kings, in which we'll define our focus and the questions we'll be looking to answer before launching into sections on the individual kings and their reigns. Radio Estros is supported by patrons, and so before we begin, let's take a moment to shout out our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patron Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons Daniel, Joel I, the Three-Eyed Bro, Chris B, the Song of Ice, Seth, Kelly, Laura, Sister Winter, Moltude, Scotty, and John Wargarian, as well as B-Word and Mr. J, the Bear and the Maiden Fair, and Sir Tim of House Jib Jab Hot Dog Shop, house motto, we forge the chains we wear in life. Thanks so much to all of you, and if you want to be a patron of the show, earn shoutouts, an invitation to our private Discord, and access to our patron-exclusive content, find us at patreon.com slash Radio Westeros. And now, it's time to get started with We Three Kings. It had long been the custom of House Targaryen to wed brother to sister to keep the blood of the dragon pure. But for whatever cause, Aegon V had become convinced that such incestuous unions did more harm than good. Instead, he resolved to join his children in marriage with the sons and daughters of some of the greatest lords of the Seven Kingdoms in the hopes of winning their support for his reforms and strengthening his rule. The final three kings of the Targaryen dynasty ruled collectively for nearly 50 years. Their reigns represent a unique period in the nearly 300-year history of the dynasty, the only time the succession remained in a direct line from grandfather to son to grandson without an untimely death, a challenge by a half-sibling, or a council of lords deciding who the next king should be. That's not to say there weren't untimely deaths and challenges to be overcome within those three reigns, but between those three generations, the succession occurred peacefully and without controversy. There's a particular reason for this, of course. Jaehaerys and his son Aerys were the only male Targaryens alive after Aegon V's death, and for good measure, they happened to be married to two of the three known female Targaryens. In other words, there really were no other options to be considered to mount a challenge or to create any sort of uncertainty whatsoever. In fact, by 259 AC, the Targaryen family was at its lowest ebb, as far as members went, than at any time since the reign of Magor the Cruel, who, having no children of his own and having killed two of his brother Aeneas' sons, left only one nephew and two nieces as possible successors. Perhaps in 259 there were Targaryen cousins to be found. We don't know who Aegon's sisters, Rhea and Diella, married after all. House Martell and Dawn were close kin, 
and there were Viella and Magor, his niece and nephew by his elder brothers, who were passed over when the great council chose Aegon in 233 after his father's death. There was also Maester Aemon, Aegon's elder brother, who refused to forswear his maesterly vows and would outlive them all. But the point remains, by the time of Aegon's death, a series of tragedies had left House Targaryen with too few heirs, a far cry from Aegon's youth when his grandfather, King Daron, was heard to say, too many dragons are as dangerous as too few. Being weak in numbers may have actually left House Targaryen poised to gain in political strength as a fairly traditional royal house must by making key marriage alliances with other noble families and avoiding the messy politics that were engendered by the Targaryen habit of marrying brother to sister to, quote, keep the bloodline pure. Most people suspect this tradition stemmed, at least in part, from a need to preserve their magical blood that allowed them to bond with dragons and, as dragon riders, dominate the Seven Kingdoms, for who could stand against such a family? But it's important to note that prior to Aegon I, the Targaryens had never ruled a kingdom, rather only a fiefdom or perhaps even a mere fortress within the Valyrian Empire. The challenges of ruling an area as vast as the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros required more of its rulers than early Targaryens were perhaps prepared for with their insular, incestuous ways, but their dragons may have masked that. All of this came to a head in the Dance of the Dragons in the second century, after which the ruling house saw their power much diminished due to the deaths of nearly all of their dragons and their failure to breed replacements. Though several generations followed wherein incest was still routinely practiced, the reign of Aegon V's grandfather, Daron the Good, changed that. With only one exception, sibling marriage ceased after the reign of Daron's father, Aegon the Unworthy. Daron married a Dornish princess, and his sons all made fairly normal dynastic marriages, alliances meant to strengthen the position of the ruling house by creating new family ties, or enhancing old ones, rather than marriages meant to strengthen the royal bloodline for magical or other reasons. Aegon V himself married a daughter of Lord Blackwood, Lady Betha, who would be known as Black Betha. As king and queen, this royal couple planned similar marriage alliances for their own sons and daughters, both to strengthen the dynasty and in the hopes of gaining support for Aegon's progressive agenda. But to paraphrase Robert Burns, and as we'll be discussing, the best laid plans of mice and men do often go awry, and it's no different for kings and queens. However, as we'll discuss, both Aegon's son Jaehaerys and his grandson Ares married their sisters, a reintroduction of a practice that Aegon had planned to allow to wither to extinction. But did this cause correction doom the Targaryen dynasty, limiting their potential offspring while failing to make inroads with noble families as Aegon had planned, or was it a corrective policy that would revitalise a bloodline that had been weakened by several generations of marriages with what were undoubtedly seen as lesser humans? In other words, did it lead directly to the rebirth of dragons in Ares' children's generation? Did these marriages in fact lead to the fulfilment of a prophetic destiny for House Targaryen? By examining these three kings and much that occurred during their reigns, we hope to gain some clarity about where the Targaryen dynasty was headed in those last fateful decades. Ultimately, there may be more questions than answers, but, as usual, we'll do our best to untangle the details to present as clear a picture as possible. And so, coming up, we'll begin with the discussion of Aegon's reign, from the Great Council, which reluctantly chose him to rule, to the years when dreams of dragons began to have an impact on his reign, to its tragic conclusion including the reasons why the king, who we first met as an idealistic and thoughtful young boy travelling Westeros as the squire of a humble hedge knight, and who became arguably the most progressive king in Westerosi history, 
would feel the need to have actual dragons on his side in order for his reign to succeed. As he grew older, Aegon V had come to dream of dragons flying once more above the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. In this, he was not unlike his predecessors, who brought septons to pray over the last eggs, mages to work spells over them, and maesters to pour over them. Though friends and counsellors sought to dissuade him, King Aegon grew ever more convinced that only with dragons would he ever wield sufficient power to make the changes he wished to make in the realm and force the proud and stubborn lords of the Seven Kingdoms to accept his decrees. When Aegon came to the throne in 233, he was considered an unlikely successor to his father. Makar had four sons, after all, of which he was the youngest. Makar himself had been the youngest of Daron's four sons, so his own reign had also been fairly unlikely. When Aegon was born in 200 AC, his father was, at best, seventh in line for the throne, while he himself was eleventh. Yet over the first two decades of Aegon's life, a series of tragic accidents and a plague known as the Great Spring Sickness would lead to the deaths of two of Aegon's uncles, his grandfather, and a number of his cousins, leaving Daron's second son Ares as king, and ultimately Aegon's own father Makar as the Prince of Dragonstone and heir apparent. Also during that time, Aegon's brother Aemon was sent to the citadel to become a maester, while his two elder brothers would eventually predecease their father, leaving only a pair of offspring of dubious prospects and making Aegon the most likely unlikely heir. In fact, one could rightly question why Aegon wasn't a more clear-cut candidate to succeed his father, perhaps even question why Makar never named him as his heir while he lived. Makar's elder sons had been problematic, to say the least. Daron, the eldest, was a well-known drunkard and womanizer who died some years before his father, reportedly from a pox caught from a sex worker. The next eldest, Arion, possessed the cruelty bordering on madness that had been seen in Targaryens from time to time. Known as the Monstrous after his elder brother dubbed him a monster, he preferred to call himself Bright Flame, perhaps fittingly, since he died drinking wildfire, believing it would transform him into a dragon. It seems like Makar would have had an easy choice in naming his fourth son Prince of Dragonstone prior to his death. But, as we'll be discussing, Aegon wasn't without his problems, and Makar's own death came as a result of a freak incident at Starpike during the Peak Uprising. Perhaps he didn't see the need to name an heir as urgent. Hindsight, as they say, is quite perfect. In the moment, and at the height of what was a relatively peaceful reign, it's possible Makar never considered the danger inherent in not naming his heir. Once the Great Council was convened by Brynden Rivers, who had served his hand since the reign of Makar's brother Ares, the objections to Aegon's candidacy became clear. His youth spent squiring for Sir Duncan the Tall had left him, quote, half a peasant, a characteristic that may have endeared the young prince to the small folk, but which left him diminished in the eyes of the great lords who sat on the council. It was due to these objections that the crown was ultimately offered first to Maester Aemon, money and power being viewed as sufficient to overcome the barrier of his vows to the citadel. Aemon, however, had avoided being drawn into politics for his entire life, and this would be no exception. In the end, the Great Council of 233 considered four candidates. Daron's daughter, Viella, a sweet but simple-minded child of eleven, whose mother, Kira of Tyrosh, had once been married to Baelor Breakspear's son, Vela. Arion's infant son, Mega, whose mother was Prince Rhaegal Targaryen's youngest daughter, Daenora. Makar's third son, Maester Aemon, and Prince Aegon. For good measure, and to prove that the Blackfire threat had yet to be fully eliminated, 
the fifth son of Damon I Blackfire, a man called Aenys, wrote to the council from Essos, requesting the opportunity to present his claim in person. Brynden Rivers lost no time in granting Aenys safe conduct to King's Landing. Upon his arrival, however, the pretender was seized by the gold cloaks and executed, his head then presented to the council to discourage any potential Blackfire sympathizers among them. After this, the council briefly considered the two children before quietly asking Maester Aemon to forsake his vows. Only when he refused was Aegon, married with five children of his own by this time, reluctantly named as king. It could be said that Aegon's life had thus far been shadowed by the Blackfire issue. From the long pall cast by the civil war that was the first Blackfire rebellion, to the second rebellion which was foiled by Sir Duncan and Aegon himself at the White Wall's tourney, to the Third Rebellion, in which Aegon fought beside his father and brother, and finally to his father's death in the Peak Uprising, arguably caused by the disaffection of House Peak, staunch Blackfire supporters whose previous lord had been executed in the wake of the Second Blackfire Rebellion. His reign would be no different. The death of Aenys Blackfire brought the issue into focus once more and left a dark cloud over the very beginning of his reign, leading Aegon to arrest his uncle Brynden Rivers for breaking the word of the Iron Throne. Bloodraven would ultimately be offered the choice of execution or taking the black, choosing the latter. When Rivers left for the Wall, he would take Aegon's elder brother Maester Aemon with him, removing a potential pawn for those who might still object to the unlikely reign of the new king. Here's what Maester Aemon would tell Jon Snow about his brother at Castle Black more than 65 years later. He was three and thirty when the great council chose him to mount the Iron Throne, a man grown with sons of his own, yet in some ways still a boy. Egg had an innocence to him, a sweetness we all loved, Kill the boy within you, I told him the day I took ship for the wall. It takes a man to rule, an Aegon, not an egg. Kill the boy and let the man be born. And so Aegon began his reign by sending away the two relatives who might have counselled him in his new role, leaving himself largely isolated, a situation which wouldn't have occurred but for the Blackfire issue. We don't know much about his early reign, but for the eventual fourth Blackfire Rebellion some three years after he took the throne, in which Aegon and Sir Duncan would combine to defeat the Golden Company and kill Daemon Blackfire's grandson, Daemon III. It would be 20 years before the rumblings of Blackfire pretension would be heard again, but we can guess that ultimately it was exactly those rumblings that may have inspired Aegon in his desperate bid to shore up his family's power. Yeah, though he was also likely inspired by a series of other things that happened in the interim. The World Book tells us that Aegon faced significant resistance from his lords throughout his reign, often forced to travel the realm, putting down uprisings. Aegon may have been beloved by the small folk, but he made enemies of many lords through his efforts to curtail their powers. His reforms, aimed at granting rights and protections to the small folk, faced fierce opposition by the ruling class, to the extent that one outspoken opponent called him, quote, a bloody-handed tyrant intent on depriving us of our God's given rights and liberties. It was during this period, when he was forced to compromise with one oppositional lord after another, that, according to the world book, he began to say that, quote, if he only had dragons, as the first Aegon had, he could have remade the realm anew, with peace and prosperity and justice for all. We can only speculate about the conversations, the desire to use fire-breathing monsters to bring his lords in line may have prompted with people like Sir Duncan the Tall, the Lord Commander of his Kingsguard, and his Queen, Betha Blackwood. We ourselves see this as evidence that the sweet summer child inside Aegon V had never truly died, 
in spite of his elder brother Amon's advice to him as he began his reign. There is an undeniable innocence in the conviction that dragons could be effectively used as a tool to help the small folk, considering that while the threat of dragon warfare may have frightened some of his lords, the reality was that more commoners had died due to dragon warfare in Westeros history than members of the nobility, as their feudal levies who would take the brunt of any conflict were inevitably drawn from the small folk, exactly as Egg would have seen in the incident at Standfast portrayed in The Sworn Sword. And it was in fact experiences just such as the ones that are portrayed to us in The Hedge Knight, The Sworn Sword and The Mystery Knight that led to Aegon's extraordinary outlook on his kingdom. Though he was often dismissed as half a peasant, we can be certain that the unique viewpoint of his youthful mentor, now the Lord Commander of his Kingsguard, had a strong impact on his ideas of fairness and justice. His own brother's imperious and cruel behaviour at Ashford Meadow, wounding the puppeteer Tanzel and using his position to attempt to bring about a hedge knight's death for the crime of standing up for someone powerless, not to mention Dunk's challenge to the assembled nobility there, are there no true knights among you, would have stood out as emblematic of the great divide between the privileged and the masses. The day-to-day life of sleeping in inns and camping in fields, working in stables and meeting real people who had to struggle and strive for their very existence, who were so often treated unfairly, who lacked the means to obtain justice and were frequently the first victims of their lord's quarrels and shortcomings, certainly wouldn't have hurt either. Makar clearly saw the value in the lessons his son was learning, though it must be said he likely never contemplated that the boy would one day sit the Iron Throne. Beyond the statement, he enacted numerous reforms and granted rights and protections to the commons that they had never known before. We're not told the exact nature of Aegon's reforms, only that he had worked for them prior to his ascension, that they were unpopular with the nobility, and that as his reign progressed, he found himself forced to compromise on many occasions to placate recalcitrant lords. It seems likely that, given the massive population losses of the first Blackfire Rebellion and the Great Spring Sickness, the reforms Aegon desired would have made it easier for peasants to leave the lands they were born to, to travel in search of work, and to obtain a fair wage— all of which would have fostered upward mobility for peasants at the expense of both their lords and the status quo. Similar developments occurred in Europe following the Black Death and the numerous wars of the 14th century, and no matter where you are, advances for peasants are always greeted with great suspicion and disapproval by the lords who sought to control the lives of their villains for their own good. The sheer unfairness of the feudal system in Westeros could have easily prompted the idealistic Aegon to seek a better way, but reforms are difficult to achieve in the best of times, and as we've said, the first three decades of the third century had not been particularly kind to House Targaryen. Nonetheless, perhaps Aegon's drive for dragons wouldn't have become quite so urgent had his sons not proved as unruly as his lords. As we mentioned in the introduction, Aegon and his wife had planned a series of highly favourable matches for their children. The eldest, Duncan, was to marry a daughter of Lord Lionel Baratheon, rekindling an old family connection and tying the Stormlands to Aegon's cause. Jaehaerys, their second son, was betrothed to a daughter of House Tully and Princess Shera to Luthor Tyrell, heir to Highgarden. A third son, Darren, would have married Lady Olenna Redwine of the Arbor. These noble connections would have been invaluable to Aegon's reign, placing three of his children in families of his lords paramount, and a fourth in the family that could field the largest navy in Westeros. But, unfortunately for Aegon, his sons had other ideas. Aegon and Betha's eldest son, Prince Duncan, also known as Duncan the Small, became Prince of Dragonstone when his father assumed the throne. 
as his father's heir, he was naturally expected to make a suitable marriage and provide the dynasty with heirs for the future. His mother arranged his betrothal to the daughter of Lord Lionel Baratheon, the same Lionel who was at Ashford Meadow in 209 AC and joined Dunk in his trial of seven against Egg's brother Arian. Besides uniting their family with that of an old friend, this would have been the first marriage between the once close houses since Jocelyn Baratheon married her nephew, Prince Aemon Targaryen, in 70 AC. But in 239 AC, traveling in the Riverlands, Prince Duncan met a mysterious girl who had come to be known as Jenny of Oldstones. Jenny claimed descent from a line of kings of the first men, possibly house mud of Oldstones, but she was essentially a commoner who some locals suspected of being a witch. She was, whatever the king's sympathies for the small folk might be, certainly not considered an appropriate match for the crown prince, one who was already betrothed to another besides. Medieval betrothals were serious things, legally binding contracts that could not be easily set aside. But Prince Duncan, taking his cue from his own parents who had married for love, took the unprecedented action of marrying Jenny against his parents' wishes. The uproar was considerable. His father commanded him to set the girl aside, his mother must have begged, and his father's small council, together with the High Septon, insisted that Duncan adhere to his betrothal agreement with Lord Lionel's daughter. His son's jilting of a highborn maiden in favour of a commoner was not likely to win King Aegon any friends amongst his lords, and so the situation was viewed as of the highest importance, and the pressure on the young Prince of Dragonstone must have been immense. Back at the end of the hedge night, when Sir Duncan was asked by Makar to join his household at Summerhall, he contemplated a dragonfly flitting freely about a field as he made his decision. It says, What shall it be, Dunk? Dragonflies or dragons? Thirty years later, it was Prince Duncan forced to decide between Dragonstone, representing his future as his father's heir, and metaphorical dragonflies, free to roam as they will. Dragonflies or Dragonstone? Like his namesake, he chose the dragonflies. And so, rather than renounce his love, the Prince of Dragonstone renounced his claim in favour of his brother Jaehaerys and would thereafter be known as the Prince of Dragonflies, a pleasantly bucolic-sounding moniker that belied the seriousness of his choice. The story of Duncan and Jenny would become a favourite of singers, but not of Lord Lionel Baratheon. The slight to his own honour and his daughter's feelings, was more than his pride could bear. Before the year was out, the laughing storm had sworn vengeance, renouncing his allegiance to Aegon, and had himself crowned the first Storm King in nearly 250 years. It would fall to Sir Duncan the Tall to defeat Lord Lionel in single combat and to Princess Rael, the youngest of Egg and Beth's children, to make the marriage with House Baratheon her brother had shunned. In 245 AC, after five years serving as Lord Lionel's cupbearer, Rael would wed his heir, Ormond Baratheon, and a year later give birth to Stephen, father of Robert, Stannis, and Renly. While in the year 239 the alliance seemed to have been salvaged, ultimately the union of Rael and Ormond would one day lead to the apparent death of House Targaryen's hopes. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. In the following year, the new Prince of Dragonstone, Jaehaerys, and his sister, Princess Shearer, aged 15 and 14 respectively, took it upon themselves to spurn their own betrothals to Celia Tully and Luthor Tyrell and elope. By the time their parents discovered it, the marriage had been consummated and there didn't seem to be any choice but to accept it. The two lords paramount, whose children had been spurned, did not follow Lord Lionel's example in rebellion, but we can imagine they were certainly not pleased, and Aegon lost two more opportunities to bind important lords to his causes. 
The final nail in the coffin of Aegon and Beth's hopes for marriage alliances would come six years later when their youngest son, Daron, simply refused to marry the girl he had been betrothed to for nine years, Lady Olenna Redwine of the Arbor. Both Duncan and Elena by this time were 18 years old, long past the time when a young noblewoman would typically be married off. Though 50 years later, Lady Olenna would tell Sansa Stark, They tried to marry me to a Targaryen once, but I soon put an end to that. The truth of the matter seems to be that Prince Daron preferred Sir Jeremy Norridge, with whom he had squired at Highgarden. Whether Olenna knew of this and accepted it, or whether she was offended by the rejection, none can say, but we can say with some confidence that her father was deeply offended. That's right. The thoughts of Barristan Selmy in A Dance with Dragons indicates that the outcome of Daron's choice differed little from those of his brothers. The Prince of Dragonflies loved Jenny of Oldstone so much he cast aside a crown, and Westeros paid the bride price in corpses. All three of the sons of the fifth Aegon had wed for love, in defiance of their father's wishes and because that unlikely monarch had himself followed his heart when he chose his queen, he allowed his sons to have their way, making bitter enemies where he might have had fast friends. So a clear reference to the Laughing Storm's Rebellion, the bride price of corpses for Prince Duncan's marriage, but also to Jeharis and Daron's choices, leaving Aegon with, quote, bitter enemies where he might have had fast friends. Okay, and now before we move on to outline the key events in the latter years of Aegon's reign, after his children's unexpected marriages, we're going to take a brief diversion back into the reign of his uncle Ares I. As we know from the stories of Duncan Egg, especially the Mystery Knight, Blackfire sentiment remained high during this period. Both the second and third attempts by House Blackfire to seize the Iron Throne occurred during Ares I's reign, and it is likely that there were numerous other small incidents as well. As such, we want to draw attention to a series of events surrounding the heirs of King Ares. Ares and his wife, Eleanor Penrose, had no children. In fact, some doubt they ever even consummated their marriage. For the first six years of his reign, his brother Rhaegal was his heir. It was said that Rhaegal was feeble-minded and weak, that he danced naked through the halls of the Red Keep, and that he would not survive to be king. Indeed, all of those things were apparently true, and in 215, Rhaegal died at a feast, choking on a lamprey pie. Now, death by lamprey bears a strong resemblance to the death of England's King Henry I, whose own death after eating lampreys sparked the succession crisis known as the Anarchy. But death by pie bears an even stronger resemblance to the death of Joffrey Baratheon, which, as we know, was brought about by the poison known as the Strangler, not necessarily in his pie, but administered in a way to make it appear that his death was a simple choking accident. Could Regal have died of a simple accident as the histories record it? Certainly. But given the peculiar fate of two of his children, it's worth considering other explanations, namely that he was poisoned by a person or persons unknown. Regal's children, Aelor and Elora were twins and married to each other, the only sibling marriage in House Targaryen since that of Aegon IV and his sister Nerys. Aelor became Aerys's heir after his father's death, but died himself two years later, according to the world book, quote, slain in a grotesque mishap by the hand of his own twin sister and wife, Elora, under circumstances that left her mad with grief. There's no elaboration of the mishap, but even so, it's easy to imagine how such a thing might have been engineered by someone with ill intent. Elora's own fate is an offhand footnote that seems significant merely as the event that cleared the way for Makar to become his brother's heir. The world book says that, quote, Elora eventually took her own life after being attacked at a masked ball by three men known to history as the Rat, the Hawk and the Pig. 
will go ahead and assume this was not long after her brother husband's death, given the phrasing of the next line, only one possible successor remained, the king's sole surviving brother, Prince Makar. A Laura's death, whether she was pregnant or simply not yet confirmed to not be pregnant, must have eliminated the possibility of a posthumous male child of Aelor, leading to the succession of Makar. And so if we're keeping track, that's three Targaryens dead in a handful of years under vaguely suspicious circumstances. Now, even as far back as 209 AC, people were mistrustful of Makar, and rumors flew that he planned to kill his brother Rhaegal to secure his own ascension. So we're certainly not alone in asking questions. The identification of a mysterious trio, the rat, the hawk, and the pig, bearing responsibility for Elora's death, strikes us as curious, however. While contemporaries may have whispered about Makar's ambitions, the people with the most to gain from weakening House Targaryen or sowing division amongst its surviving members were still none other than Blackfire loyalists, as evidenced by the continued efforts throughout the 3rd century of Daemon Blackfire's descendants to claim the Iron Throne for themselves. But in spite of a high possibility of nefarious actions, these incidents still might have faded into obscurity, chalked up as more unfortunate events in a family that certainly suffers more than its fair share of those, but for something that happened 30 years later. In 251 AC, during Aegon V's reign, the rat, the hawk and the pig reappear in the histories as rebels, whose rebellion required Aegon to deploy an army led by Prince Daron, a quote, born soldier, who was happiest on the battlefield or tourney ground. The nature of the rebellion isn't mentioned, but given the reference to a trio by the same name in Aerys I's reign, and the recurring flares of Blackfire sentiment over the course of Aegon's life, including the uprising that led him to the throne, we speculate that the rat, the hawk, and the pig were somehow connected to the Blackfire cause. The tragedy of it is that Prince Daron was killed in putting down their rebellion, along with Sir Jeremy Norwich. The story apparently ends after Daron's death, as we're told the rebels were all slain or hanged. But if there was a Blackfire connection, and if it extended all the way back to the reign of his uncle Ares, we can guess Aegon may have been aware of it, or at least suspected. And if he could attribute multiple deaths within his immediate and extended family to Blackfire pretensions, it's easy to see how his anxiety over the waning power of House Targaryen, along with their diminishing numbers and their lack of support amongst the nobility, likely half of whose families had supported Daemon Blackfire in his first rebellion, would lead to a sense of urgency, desperation, or even obsession with bringing dragons back into the equation on the side of the ruling family. In the Mystery Night, as Sir Duncan the Tall and his squire watched the second Blackfire Rebellion play out, Dunk thought, if a living dragon appeared again in Westeros, the lords and small folk alike would flock to whichever prince could lay claim to it. Having witnessed firsthand the power of the mere promise of a dragon hatchling, perhaps it's no wonder that when he found himself in need of allies and supporters later in life, Aegon's thoughts would return to dragons. When the subject of dragon eggs came up for the first time in the Mystery Night, the young Aegon expressed his conviction about dragons to dunk. Someday the dragons will return, my brother Daron's dreamed of it, and King Ares read it in a prophecy. Maybe it will be my egg that hatches. That would be splendid. So from a young age, Aegon was well aware of dragon dreams and prophecies dealing with the return of dragons, as well as how powerful the promise of dragons could be. Yeah, and while he ultimately witnessed how the dreams of his brother Daron and his cousin Damon Blackfire held only metaphorical truths, there was also apparently an element of prophecy. 
We know that Bloodraven, a reputed sorcerer, studied all types of esoterica, and that King Aerys I was known for preferring books and scrolls to his own wife. Aegon told Dunk that Aerys had read about the return of dragons in a prophecy. Beyond that, we have no idea what other knowledge or conversations may have occurred around that subject during the course of Aegon's life, but we do know that later in his life, he was directly exposed to a woman who was almost certainly the prophetic ghost of High Heart whom we first met in Arya Stark's point of view in the Riverlands in A Storm of Swords. When Prince Duncan brought his wife, Jenny of Oldstones, to court, she was accompanied by a, quote, dwarfish albino woman who was reputed to be a woods witch in the Riverlands. The World Book goes on to state that Lady Jenny claimed the woman was a child of the forest. And as much as the maesters recording the history want to deny it, she is certainly like the children in stature and has those red eyes attributed to their green seers, although she is different in other respects. In A Storm of Swords, the woman tells the Brotherhood Without Banners about her prophetic dreams, all of which came true with startling accuracy. Thoris of Mir tells Arya that, quote, she has her own way of knowing things, that one, the weirwoods whisper in her ear when she sleeps. And weirwood visions, as we've seen, are incredibly accurate, more along the lines of divine communication than dreams or visions. At Aegon's court, it was said that she told Prince Jaehaerys that the prince that was promised would be born from a union of his children, Ares and Rhaella. Given that all of her prophecies that we hear in Arya's point of view are couched in figurative language based on sigil imagery, it's not hard to imagine that her prophecy to Jaehaerys might have expressly connected this prince that was promised with dragons. It must be said that the World Book indicates that King Aegon was exasperated by Jaehaerys' wish to marry Ares to Rhaella based on the woman's declaration, but he did nonetheless allow it to happen. Perhaps the prophecy swayed him, or perhaps by this time Aegon was having his own dreams of dragons. We know that at some point he did have the same type of dreams his brother Darren described in The Hedge Knight, and which Arian must have also experienced, leading to his conviction that he would be reborn as a dragon if he drank wildfire. Maester Aemon declared that dragon dreams were the death of all of his brothers, which indicates he knew of Aegon's dreams and what they inspired him towards. For all Targaryens following the death of the last dragon in Aegon III's reign, surely dreams about dragons were tinged with hope and yearning. That they seemed to be so frequently prophetic of some significant event, though often misinterpreted, would only make them more potent for the dreamers. Were Arion's dreams prophetic, even figuratively, as Daron's were? We'll never know, just as we'll never know what exactly Aegon's dreams told him. But we do know that he had them, and that, more than 40 years later, his brother Aemon blamed his death upon them. Which brings us to the year 259 A.C. What became of the dream of dragons was a grievous tragedy born in a moment of joy. In the fateful year 259 AC, the king summoned many of those closest to him to Summerhall, his favorite castle, there to celebrate the impending birth of his first great-grandchild, a boy later named Rhaegar, to his grandson Ares and granddaughter Rhaella, the children of Prince Jaehaerys. In the year 258, word arrived in Westeros that a group of nine mercenaries and pirates from Essos, calling themselves the Band of Nine, had joined forces pledging to carve out a kingdom for each, starting in the disputed lands but ultimately targeting Westeros itself, as one of their key members was a man called Maelys Blackfire, the current leader of the Golden Company, who had come to power by murdering his cousin, Damon Blackfire. 
Meles was the last male descendant of Damon I, and the Band of Nine would turn out to be the biggest threat by a Blackfire cause since the death of Agor Rivers nearly 20 years previously. Not that the threat was taken too seriously at first. The Nine Penny Kings, the name by which the outlaw group would come to be known, came about when Prince Duncan joked that crowns were being sold nine a penny in Essos. Still, Aegon must have felt some threat because he ordered certain preparations for war be made. But where the World Book and Maester Yandel see no particular urgency in his preparations, we suggest the urgency was focused elsewhere. The history, they write, tells us that, quote, Aegon remained intent on his reign, and intent on one more thing, dragons. Attributing Aegon's desire for dragons to his hopes for a legacy of reform is all well and good, but given the long shadow of House Blackfire over his life, and especially the events of the second Blackfire rebellion at Whitewalls, it's hard to imagine that Aegon didn't also see dragons as a way to end Blackfire pretensions once and for all. Nonetheless, he clearly also saw dragons as a tool that would allow him to, quote, wield sufficient power to make the changes he wished to make in the realm and force the proud and stubborn lords of the Seven Kingdoms to accept his decrees. As he was approaching 60 years old and nearly 30 years into his reign, the pressure to cement his legacy must have been strong. And without those favorable marriage alliances, it's clear Aegon had to look elsewhere to achieve his goals. And there was never any doubt what those goals were. And so, the World Book tells us, the last years of Aegon's reign were consumed by a search for ancient lore about the dragon breeding of Valyria, and it was said that Aegon commissioned journeys to places as far away as a shy by the shadow with the hopes of finding texts and knowledge that had not been preserved in Westeros. What the maesters writing the histories didn't know about or mention is the king's dreams. And if Aegon was experiencing real, recurring dreams of the return of dragons, we do know that he would have had no shortage of dragon eggs to experiment with. It was still common practice for Targaryen babies to be given cradle eggs, and there was still a supply of additional eggs to be found in a cache below Dragonstone. And so in the year 259 AC, as the birth of his first great-grandchild was imminent, Aegon summoned the blood of the dragon to their family retreat at Summerhall. The babe about to be born was the result of the match between Ares and Rhaella that had been prophesied by the Woods Witch, which might have seemed to the king like a propitious time to try something daring. In A Dance with Dragons, Barristan Selmy attributes what happened at Summerhall directly to Aegon's sons breaking their betrothals and the consequent ire of the jilted noble families. Treason and turmoil followed as night follows day, ending at Summerhall in sorcery, fire, and grief. But after years of study, Aegon must have found sufficient information to give him hope that whatever they planned would work. However, based on a fragmentary letter sent by Summerhall's maester, Corso, before he died, we can surmise that the elements Barristan mentioned, sorcery, fire, and grief, were all involved. In fact, it's worth looking at the six fragments of that message, one by one, to help us piece together what happened. The first fragment is the blood of the dragon gathered in one. We can assume this is a reference to Aegon's summon to his family to gather together for the occasion. The phrasing seems to indicate that the entire family, the blood of the dragon, was assembled. The emphasis on their blood, perhaps a hint at the type of magic or sorcery that was planned. And the second fragment actually seems to support the idea that the entirety of the royal family was present. It says... Seven eggs to honor the seven gods, though the king's own septon had warned. So pairing the knowledge that each family member would possess their own egg, bestowed upon them in their cradles, with the idea that the phrase blood of the dragon indicates the whole clan, we can come up with seven Targaryens if we include the baby about to be born, Aegon, 
his children, Duncan, Jaehaerys, and Shara, his grandchildren, Aerys and Rhaella, and the Bay Bragar. It's unknown if Rael, the wife of Ormond Baratheon, would have been present, or even if she was still alive, based on the fact that she only gave her husband one son that we know of in 246. We could imagine that she had died at some time since his birth, but it's also entirely possible that she was present and made the seventh, with the new babe not being counted. And so we speculate that the seven eggs were paired with seven Targaryens, one of whom may have been a brand new life, and surely the birth of a metaphorical dragon was a good omen for the birth of an actual dragon. The next two fragments go together, pyromancers and wildfire, and really this is pretty self-explanatory. Aegon must have discovered something about fire, and perhaps wildfire in particular, that led him to believe that it was a required element to hatching an egg. Let's not forget the prophecies that Melisandre seems to be working with in the main series. Azor Ahai would be reborn using king's blood and fire to wake a dragon from stone. All of the elements she is seeking seem to be present at Summerhall if we correlate Azor Ahai reborn with the prince that was promised. The next fragment of Corso's letter is Flames Grew Out of Control, Towering, burn so hot that puts us in the moment where everything went wrong. A disaster unfolding in the midst of what was meant to be a joyous and even triumphant occasion. And the final part of the letter hints at heroism amidst the catastrophe. Died, but for the valour of the Lord Commander. As we said in our episode on the Hedge Knight, this fragment is our window into the end of Sir Duncan the Tall's life. On the day that was the great tragedy at Summerhall, someone or some people would have died but for his valor. This comes as no surprise given everything we know about Dunk, his devotion to Aegon, and the seriousness with which he viewed a knight's vows and likely would have done for his Kingsguard vows. And there's a persistent idea in the fandom that this moment was actually Sir Duncan's raison d'etre, both in story and from a meta standpoint. In The Hedge Knight, after Baelor breaks Spear's death, Dunk tells Prince Makar, If I had not fought, you would have had my hand off, and my foot. Sometimes I sit under that tree there, and look at my feet, and ask if I couldn't have spared one. How could my foot be worth a prince's life? He goes on to quote his old mentor, Sir Arlen of Pennytree. The old man, Sir Arlen, every day at evenfall he'd say, I wonder what the morrow will bring. He never knew, no more than we do. Well, mightn't it be that some morrow will come when I'll have need of that foot, when the realm will need that foot even more than a prince's life? And so the speculation goes that the person or persons saved by Dunk and his foot at Summerhall were none other than Rhaella and the newborn Rhaegar. Whether the foot in this case is a metaphorical reference, as in the mere existence of an actual foot rather than the amputated limb he was threatened with in the Hedge Knight, gave him the power to perform this act, or whether he did something that actually physically involved his foot, like kicking down a door for instance, we may never know. But again, as we pointed out in our The Hedge Knight episode, it's worth asking what thanks the realm should give for having exchanged Baylor Breakspear, a prince who, quote, had it in him to be a great king, the greatest since Aegon the Dragon, for a newborn babe who would grow up to become the flashpoint of a rebellion that led to the downfall of his house. Yes, certainly if Rhaegar had turned out to be the prince that was promised, this might seem fairly clear-cut. But in spite of the words of the Woods Witch, Rhaegar himself would come to believe that they didn't refer to him specifically, but to his son. As much as his great-grandsire Aegon collected dragon lore the world over, Rhaegar was known to be a scholar of ancient scrolls, and he communicated with his great-great-uncle, Maester Aemon, about what he discovered. Aemon tells Samuel Tarly in A Feast for Crows, 
It was a prince that was promised. Rhaegar, I thought. The smoke was from the fire that devoured Summerhall on the day of his birth. The salt from the tears shed for those who died. He shared my belief when he was young, but later he became persuaded that it was his own son who fulfilled the prophecy, for a comet had been seen above King's Landing on the night Aegon was conceived, and Rhaegar was certain the bleeding star had to be a comet. This appears to be the very same prophecy Melisandre is working from. And we shouldn't forget that the Woods Witch had prophesied that a promised prince would be born of the line of Rhaella and Ares. Critically, she does not seem to have specified it would be their child. Rhaegar must have realized through his research that some aspect of his own birth didn't fit the prophecy and became convinced it was his destiny to father the prince. And apparently he believed that his son with Ilya Martell whose own family had Targaryen heritage from a marriage several generations past, would be the destined prince, possibly right up until that child's birth. To review, a prince born amidst salt and smoke under the sign of a bleeding star has been prophesied to save Westeros. Melisandre of Ashai will believe it's Aegon's great-grandson Stannis, while Rhaegar himself apparently believed it was his son Aegon. Maester Aemon's conviction at the end of his life that it was Ares and Rhaella's daughter Daenerys seems to come in part because of the rebirth of dragons. The dragons prove it, he will tell Sam, indicating a likely connection between the prophecy Ares I had read about dragons returning and the prophesied prince. And of course, if Dunk saved Rhaella herself on that day in 259, he would have ensured that she lived to one day give birth to Daenerys. Of course, what nobody in Westeros knows is that there is a second option. The classic prince in hiding, Rhaegar's son by Lyanna Stark, Jon Snow. If we attribute some significance to Melisandre's thought, I pray for a glimpse of Azor Ahai and R'hllor shows me only snow, begins to seem like perhaps Rhaegar was correct that his son is indeed the prince that was promised who will stand against the other when they come to Westeros. And so, whether the person Sir Duncan saved from the Inferno at Summerhall was the infant Prince Rhaegar or his mother Rhaella, he would have safeguarded the future of Westeros, ensuring that the day could come when the realm would be thankful for his foot and would find that Baylor Breakspear's life had not been too high a price to pay after all. Most of the details of Summerhall are obscured by the author. Even Maester Corso's letter is reported to have been the victim of an ink spill, literally obscuring many of the words he wrote. It could be that the knowledge or prophecies that Aegon was working with would be too revealing of the author's endgame, or it could be that the dearth of details on the event is simply meant to provide mystery and a feeling of verisimilitude. To this end, the world of ice and fire has this to say about the lack of clear information. It is unfortunate that the tragedy that transpired at Summerhall left very few witnesses alive, and those who survived would not speak of it. But three people who were alive in the year 259 make tantalizing references to it in the main series. In A Clash of Kings, Alistair Florent defends his actions as Stannis's hand to Davos Seaworth, expressing his doubts about Melisandre of Ashai. This talk of a stone dragon, madness, I tell you, sheer madness. Did we learn nothing from Arion Brightfire, from the Nine Mages, from the Alchemists? Did we learn nothing from Summerhall? No good has ever come from these dreams of dragons. The Nine Mages and the Alchemists are referenced to incidents in the reign of Aegon III and Aegon IV, but Florent draws a straight line between dragon dreams and whatever happened at Summerhall. And then there's Barristan Selmy. Summerhall comes up in his words or thoughts several times in Marine. He tells Danny in the Storm of Swords how much Rhaegar loved the place, and though it made him melancholy, it also inspired his music. Summerhall was the place the prince loved best. 
he would go there from time to time with only his harp for company. Even the knights of the king's guard did not attend him there. He liked to sleep in the ruined hall beneath the moon and stars, and whenever he came back he would bring a song. When you heard him play his high harp with the silver strings and sing of twilights and tears and the death of kings, you could not but feel that he was singing of himself and those he loved. In fact, many fans suspect this reference to Rhaegar's songs might actually tie in with the third person who mentions the tragedy. In A Storm of Swords, the so-called Ghost of High Heart tells Arya Stark, I gorged on grief at Summerhall and requests my Jenny's song when Thomas Evans asks what music she would have him play. Barristan Selmy assumes Jenny's woodwitch died at Summerhall, placing her there on that fateful day, and her statement about grief leaves us with the distinct impression that the ghost was one of the few survivors mentioned in the world book. Amongst the other survivors would almost certainly be Jaehaerys and Shera, their children Ares and Rhaella, and the infant Rhaegar. The names and stations of any others are lost to time, though it's worth pointing out that Barristan's assumption about the Woods Witch might indicate that there were more survivors than some thought. The references to sorcery and pyromancy, for instance, indicate that sorcerers and pyromancers were present. While most of these practitioners likely perished in the flames, it still remains possible that one day George will introduce another survivor to shed light on the event for us. Now let's talk about those who didn't survive the conflagration when everything went wrong with Aegon's plans and the Targaryen summer palace became a charnel house. Maester Aemon mentions to Sam, quote, the fire that devoured Summerhall and the tears shed for those who died. The deaths were probably far greater than those that have been expressly stated. Aegon himself, Prince Duncan, Sir Duncan, and the Maester are confirmed deaths. We don't know when Betha died, though since she's never mentioned in her son's reign, she either predeceased her husband or they died together in 259. Ditto Princess Riel, and based on the ghost of High Heart's grief, we can assume Lady Jenny of Oldstones also perished. In a family whose dreams of dragons so often presage disaster, or perhaps even lead to disaster, the Inferno of Summerhall stands out as a stunning conclusion to a story that we saw begin with so much promise in those early tales about Aegon's youth. We've shown how his youthful experiences and progressive values, paired with a lack of support from his lords and the defiance of his children, along with the continued threat from House Blackfire, all worked to bring him to a place where the rebirth of dragons seemed to be of paramount importance to him. We can't help but see a certain sad irony in the fact that Aegon's cousin Daemon Blackfire's dreams of a dragon hatching at White Walls actually indicated the presence of Egg himself, while Aegon's own dreams of a dragon being born amidst the flames, in hindsight, almost certainly indicated the birth of Prince Rhaegar, who would come to be known as the Last Dragon. In spite of the fact that the dragon dreams we know of are almost 100% metaphorical in nature, it seems like the blood of the dragon can't help but hold out hope that one day their dreams will literally come true. Up next, we'll review the brief reign of Aegon's son Jaehaerys, whose own dreams of dragons may have led to the marriage of his son and daughter and the birth of the last dragon, and who was faced with the final Blackfyre Rebellion all too soon after the tragedy at Summerhall. The grief and glory of my house. I see them in my dreams. I see their shadows on the snow, hear the crack of their leathern wings, feel their hot breath. My brothers dreamed of dragons too, and the dreams killed them, every one. (laughs) 
And now at the midpoint of the episode, it's time for us to give thanks to our patrons from the Valyrian Steel level. Thanks to Erodo, Aileen, Akiva of House Hunt, Aka from Ashai, Oxheart, Amber the Adamant, Anna, Hortense of Ashai, Blight Spirit, Cabeth the Unfrozen, Marge of the Mage, David, Dean, Drew, Sir Sorcedelica, James K., Lord Sosa and his faithful canine companion Theoden, Jill, Miss Jody, J.M., Herbert Westeros, the Miskatonic Maester, Epimetheus, Juna of House Aiko, Casey, Lady Silverwing, Infendaris, the Unspeakable Terror, Boss, the Sothorian, Sally, Sheila, Tristis Lorraine, Wild Child of the Wolfswood, W, Sword of the Evening, and Lady Diarlis of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. Though never strong, Jaehaerys II proved to be a capable king, restoring order to the Seven Kingdoms and reconciling many of the great houses who had grown unhappy with the Iron Throne because of King Aegon V's attempted reforms. Jaehaerys II came to the throne in the shadow of a great family tragedy, having lost at least his father and brother, and possibly a mother and sister as well, his wife Shara, their children, and newborn grandson were among the only survivors of Summerhall. Though he was neither a strong man nor skilled in military matters, he is noted to have been intelligent and not lacking in courage, and so his reign, though it would be brief, had some notable successes. No sooner had Jaehaerys returned to King's Landing after Summerhall than news came that the Band of Nine had taken the Stepstones and thus were positioned to launch an attack on the Seven Kingdoms. Like his father and older brother, Jaehaerys had hoped that the Band of Nine would be defeated or elsewise disintegrate during fighting in Essos. With Meles the Monstrous declaring himself King Meles the First Blackfire and leading the band on the Stepstones, it was clear that more than hope was called for. Meles Blackfire had been dubbed the Monstrous at birth when it was declared he had devoured his own twin in the womb. The evidence for this act was a secondary small head protruding goiter-like from his neck, the head never grew larger than a fist, and it's never noted if the unusual appendage spoke or saw or smelled, only that it existed and contributed to the demonic reputation of the man. As we said, Maley seized control of the Golden Company by defeating his cousin Damon, twisting the man's head from his shoulders after killing his destrier with a Gregor Clegane-like punch. Though it's never noted from which of Damon the first sons either descended only that they were the last two male descendants of the Blackfire line. Blackfires had been troubling the peace of the realm for more than 60 years at this point, and while their overt support had waned amongst the lords of Westeros during that time, Aegon V's unpopular reforms had left the ruling house in a precarious position. It was no accident that Bloodraven had executed the Blackfire claimant at the beginning of Aegon's reign, as the Hand would have been all too aware of both lingering Blackfire sentiment and the danger it would pose to his reform-minded nephew. For Jaehaerys, with the last male Blackfire sitting off the coast of Westeros readying an invasion, this would be a case of once more into the breach, a final attempt to put an end to the Blackfire threat once and for all. In fact, that reference to Shakespeare's Henry V is no accident. There's a certain similarity in the length and causes of the Blackfire rebellions to the Hundred Years' War between England and France, though admittedly with many role reversals and inversions. That said, this last attempt to defeat the Blackfires would be to Westeros as Henry V's final campaign in France was to England, the final chapter in a generations-long war that would decide the issue at stake once and for all. And so, setting aside his mourning, the new king summoned his lords and their levies and made ready to meet the threat upon the Stepstones rather than wait for an attack. While Jaehaerys would gladly have led the campaign himself and fully intended to do so, his hand and brother-in-law, Lord Ormond Baratheon, objected. As Jaehaerys wasn't used to or skilled in military campaigns, the hand argued, his presence would unnecessarily endanger the kingship so soon after his father's death. 
and so Jeheris relented and allowed Lord Ormond to lead the army. We know from the World Book that a thousand knights and ten thousand men-at-arms from the West responded to the king's summons, and that Lord Quellon Greyjoy contributed a hundred longships, while Dorn sent an unnumbered company of spearmen. They were men from the Stormlands, Riverlands, North, Vale, and Reach present as well, and if we consider the relative size and strength of all the regions, we can surmise that the assembled host that went to the Stepstones probably exceeded fifty to 60,000 men-at-arms, along with thousands of knights, squires, and sailors. Among this host would be the Prince of Dragonstone, Ares Targaryen, along with seven current or future Lords Paramount, Hoster Tully, Rickard Stark, John Arryn, Lord Ormond, and his son Stephen Baratheon, Tywin Lannister, and Quellon Greyjoy. In fact, many of the key relationships that would shape the future of Westeros were forged upon the Stepstones. But it was a young knight from a minor house in the Stormlands who would distinguish himself most of all. The Hand, Lord Ormond Baratheon, was one of the first to die when the Westerosi forces landed on the Stepstones. He was killed by Maelys Blackfire himself and died in his son Stefan's arms. Command of the army then passed to the new Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Sir Gerald Hightower. The army under Sir Gerald seems to have been merely holding their own without making significant progress towards victory when the ebb and flow of battle brought Maelys into single combat with Sir Barristan Selmy. Dubbed Barristan the Bold by Prince Duncan after he entered a tournament as a mystery knight while still a young squire, and eventually knighted by Aegon V at the age of 16 after unhorsing both Prince Duncan and Sir Duncan the Tall at attorney, Selmy, quote, cut a bloody path through the Golden Company to reach Maelys and kill him. As the World Book has it, Maelys' death decided the issue in a stroke, for the remainder of the Nine Penny Kings had little or no interest in Westeros and soon fell back to their own domains. Soon enough, though a cost had been paid in bloodshed, there was peace in the realm once more. Sir Barristan was named to the King's Guard by King Jaehaerys, who was proving to be a more than capable king. He restored order across the realm and was able to reconcile many of the lords who had been displeased with his father's reforms. We don't know to what extent he may have rolled back those reforms, for we're never told whether he shared or rejected his father's progressive ideals, though he was noted to be much more conservative than Aegon when it came to Targaryen marriage practices. That's not to say Jaehaerys was blindly in favour of reviving old traditions. It was he who told Barristan Selmy that, quote, Madness and greatness are two sides of the same coin. Every time a new Targaryen is born, the gods toss the coin in the air and the world holds its breath to see how it will land. To have such a clear-sighted vision of the realities of his family history, we think he'd probably have been more of a mind with his father than not. Though perhaps such a pragmatic statement also indicates a realism that his father didn't possess, leading to more of a willingness to compromise with the laws of the realm, for instance, than Aegon had. Another thing we aren't told is if he ever had thoughts or dreams about dragons. We can guess, however, that there was a time when he did dream of dragons. How else to explain how easily he was influenced by the woods witch who was brought to court by his sister-in-law to marry his son and daughter to each other against their will? For while Jaehaerys and his sister Shara are said to have longed to be together since their childhood, much like his namesake Jaehaerys I and his sister queen, Alysanne, it's made equally clear that Ares and Riella did not share this desire for sibling marriage. Barristan tells Daenerys in A Dance with Dragons that there was no fondness between her parents, that each actually would have preferred another, Sir Bonifer Hasty and Lady Joanna Lannister specifically. But in spite of this, and the fact that King Aegon expressly disapproved of the match between his grandchildren, it said he washed his hands of it after the woods which made a prophecy about the prince that was promised being born of their line, and Jaehaerys insisted. 
But given the theme of marrying for love in their family, the supposed reason why Aegon and Betha allowed four of their children to follow their hearts, one has to wonder why Jaehaerys would insist on forcing his children into an unhappy, incestuous marriage. A prophecy by a woods witch hardly seems like sufficient reason on its own, even in a family that seems highly attuned to prophecy. But if such a prophecy were paired with dragon dreams, it begins to feel more like affirmation of something Jaehaerys may have already had in mind. In other words, the ghost of High Heart may not have single-handedly introduced the idea of the Ares and Rayella match into the family. We will, of course, probably never know for sure unless Sir Barristan, who is a font of information about both Jaehaerys and his children, casts light upon it one day. Another thing Barristan could shed light upon, though he has not as yet, is the fate of Jaehaerys' sister queen, Shera. She's last mentioned remaining in King's Landing with her husband and presumably her daughter and grandson, when the royal army marched for the Stepstones. Like her sister Rael, wife of Lord Ormond and mother to Stefan, we have no idea when she died. Did she live to a ripe old age, or did she die young? Given the eventual course of her son's reign, and in spite of the fact that in 260 Shearer would have been a mere 34 years old, we tend to think it was sadly the latter. And speaking of dying young, Jaehaerys himself was destined to rule for a bare three years. In 262 AC, just three years after ascending the throne, Jaehaerys took to his bed after complaining of a shortness of breath. He died, possibly of heart failure or some other unknown disease, at the age of 37. Jaehaerys was born a second son and only inherited due to his older brother's abdication, Although since Prince Duncan died at Summerhall along with her father, perhaps that distinction didn't matter in the end. His extremely brief reign was competent and notable mainly for the end of the era of Blackfire pretenders. Only Aegon II and Viserys II had shorter reigns than he. The former was murdered and the latter ascended the throne when he was already an ageing man, having served his brother and two nephews as hand for nearly 40 years. It's evident that Barristan Selmy, the only POV with first-hand memories of him, admired Jaehaerys in a way he never did his son. Nonetheless, after his death in 262, the 18-year-old Prince of Dragonstone would ascend the Iron Throne as King Ares II. His reign would be both longer and far more eventful than his father's had been, as we'll discuss in the next segment. Upon his coronation, Ares declared that it was his wish to be the greatest king in the history of the Seven Kingdoms, a conceit certain of his friends encouraged by suggesting that one day he might be remembered as Ares the Wise, or even Ares the Great. The World Book tells us that Ares II was handsome and charming, though he was neither the most diligent of princes nor the most intelligent. He had participated in the War of the Nine Penny Kings, acquitting himself well, and was knighted by his childhood friend Tywin Lannister on the battlefield. Ares, Tywin, and his cousin Stephen Baratheon had grown up together as pages in his grandfather's court and were said to be inseparable as youths. Unfortunately, in spite of his better qualities and those two close friendships, Ares would also turn out to be vain and proud, traits which made him a target for the, quote, flatterers and lickspittles who would surround him as his reign progressed. When he assumed the throne in 262, Ares dismissed all of the older seasoned men who had advised his father, many of whom had also served his grandfather, and replaced them with young men of his own generation, notably naming Sir Tywin as his hand in place of Lord Edgar Sloane, who had served as his father's hand since the death of Ormond Baratheon on the Stepstones. We don't know who else served on Ares' small council in the early years, other than Grandmaster Pycelle and Lord Commander Gerald Hightower of the Kingsguard, both of whom had also served his father, 
and whom Ares did not have the power to dismiss or replace, the Grand Maester being appointed by the Citadel and members of the King's Guard traditionally serving for life. But Tywin would come to be the most powerful man in the realm, governing with a firm and steady hand while his king amused himself with a variety of entertainments. Though married to his sister at a young age because of his father's interest in prophecy, and already the father of three-year-old Prince Rhaegar, Ares nonetheless soon developed a reputation as somewhat of a playboy. He loved parties, dancing, and young women, and it was said early in his reign that he had as many mistresses as his ancestor, Aegon IV, though he tended to lose interest in most fairly quickly. One woman he didn't seem to lose interest in was his friend Tywin's cousin, Joanna Lannister. Barristan tells Danny in A Dance with Dragons that Ares preferred Lady Joanna to his sister Rhaella, who in turn favoured a young knight from the Stormlands called Boniface Hasty. Though Joanna apparently only arrived in King's Landing after Ares married his sister, coming to the capital for Jaehaerys' coronation and remaining to be a lady-in-waiting to Rhaella. There would be persistent rumours that Ares took Joanna's maidenhead at his father's coronation and that she resumed the relationship as his paramour after his own coronation three years later. Regardless, she remained as a companion to Rhaella for more than four years until shortly after her own marriage to her cousin Tywin. The World Book tells us that, quote, it has been reliably reported that King Ares took unwanted liberties with Lady Joanna's person during her bedding ceremony, while Barristan tells Danny that her father had lamented aloud that the king's right of first night had been abolished, to the dismay of his friend and hand. Shortly after, Queen Rhaella abruptly dismissed Lady Joanna from her service, stating that she didn't appreciate her husband, quote, turning my ladies into his whores. While the history takes pains to state that Joanna wasn't the only lady to be so dismissed, it seems clear that the statement was made at the time of Joanna's dismissal specifically and that there was therefore some truth to the rumours of a relationship between her and the king in spite of the world book's insistence that Tywin would have been too proud to take another man's leavings. In spite of the rumours and speculation surrounding Ares and Joanna, once she departed the city, the king in hand appeared to continue on as good terms as ever. Tywin took the business of ruling the kingdom much more seriously than the king himself did, and it was arguably due to his diligence that the realm prospered early in Ares' reign. While Tywin settled a dispute with the Iron Bank of Bravos, reduced tariffs on trade in King's Landing, Old Town, and Lannisport, increased trade with the free cities, regulated artisans, built roads, hosted tournaments, and, most significantly, repealed the reforms from Aegon V's reign, Ares was free to travel, attend balls, flirt with young women, and concoct one grandiose improvement scheme after the next. These schemes ranged from his ambitious desires to conquer the stepstones or to, in a sort of reverse new gift, build a new wall a hundred leagues north of the existing one and claim all the land in between, from plans to build a new white city south of the Blackwater Rush or to make the Dornish deserts bloom by digging an underground canal to carry water from the rainwood. None of his grand schemes ever amounted to anything, in spite of the fact that he seems to have proposed at least a couple of them to his lords. Like many of his predecessors, it may be that Ares had dreams that led him to some of these schemes early on, and to much more sinister activities later in his reign. Jamie Lannister remarks in A Storm of Swords that Ares's later-in-life wildfire obsession was not unlike that of his great-uncle Arion Brightflame. Given that we know that at least part of Arion's madness, specifically the part that led to his death by wildfire, may have been caused by dragon dreams, it's not a great leap to consider the same about Ares. 
Still, it's not clear to what extent Ares was concerned with dragons or dreams or prophecies early in his reign, in spite of the fact that he had been married to his sister on account of a prophecy, and in spite of the drive by his grandfather to hatch dragon eggs that led to his own death and that of others, while placing Ares and his immediate family in such grave danger. What is clear is that the darkness in Ares became apparent within a handful of years of his ascension. We mentioned his erratic behavior around improvement schemes that never came to anything and his inconstant womanizing, but it's possible that the first true hints at his madness arose related to his queen's problems with childbearing. Between 262 and 270 AC, Rayella suffered two miscarriages, two stillbirths, and the death of a son, Prince Daron, at six months old. Ares decided his sister had been unfaithful and decreed she would be restricted to Mager's holdfast and attended by two septas round the clock. Nonetheless, the following four years brought only another miscarriage and two more infant deaths. It was after this eighth loss that Ares decided first that the babe's wet nurse had poisoned him, and then that his current mistress had been responsible. Both women and the mistress's family were put to death. Deciding he had been mistaken, Ares then made a walk of repentance and swore that he would be faithful to his wife from that time forward, a vow that must have Please the gods, since the following year, Queen Rhaella gave birth to Prince Viserys to the king's delight. Ares' delight in the birth of his second son was shadowed with paranoia, though. The World Book reports that, quote, Kingsguard knights were commanded to stand over him night and day to see that no one touched the boy without the king's leave. Even the queen herself was forbidden to be alone with the infant. When her milk dried up, Ares insisted on having his own food taster suckle at the teats of the prince's wet nurse to ascertain that the woman had not smeared poison on her nipples. As gifts for the young prince arrived from all the lords of the Seven Kingdoms, the king had them piled in the yard and burned for fear that some of them might have been ensorcelled or cursed. This was 13 years into his reign, and by this point his erratic behaviour and paranoia seemed to be well established. In these years, his relationship with his hand and one-time dearest friend had also suffered. As the realm prospered thanks to the Han's efficient administration, it came to be whispered that Tywin was the true power behind the throne, and when Ares became aware of it, their relationship began to sour. Ares began to actively seek to humiliate and oppose his hand. And certainly the situation with Lady Joanna didn't help matters. Always eager to make comments about Joanna to his, quote, overmighty servant that would tweak Tywin's nose, Ares was clearly jealous of his hand's marriage. And when Lady Joanna died in childbed in 273 AC after giving birth to the deformed infant Tyrion, Ares made a comment that managed to destroy the last vestiges of their friendship. The gods cannot abide such arrogance. They have plucked a fair flower from his hand and given him a monster in her place, to teach him some humility at last. Following this, the king began to seek out informants and tale-tellers. Always on the lookout for treason and disloyalty, when Ares discovered that Sir Ilin Payne, the captain of the Han's personal guard, had been heard to say that Lord Tywin was the true ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, he sent his king's guard to arrest him and had his tongue ripped out with red-hot pincers. Paranoid and insecure, Ares began from this time forward to isolate himself among toadies and sycophants. In the meantime, Ares' heir, Prince Rhaegar, had grown into a fine young man. From an early age, Rhaegar appeared to be everything a prince should be, intelligent, handsome, accomplished with both sword and harp, and beloved by small folk and nobles alike. In A Song of Ice and Fire, opinions of him in memory are almost universally positive, with the glaring exception of Robert Baratheon's. 
Born of a marriage that occurred as a result of a prophecy and possibly the dragon dreams of his father and grandfather, his birth was inevitably shadowed by the great tragedy at Summerhall that took the lives of so many of his family even as he was entering the world. And it may be that the circumstances of his birth inspired him towards scholarship. It said he was reading scrolls from a very young age, and we know that at some point he also carried on a correspondence about prophecy with his uncle Maester Aemon Targaryen at the Wall. That the course of his life was directed by knowledge presumably gained from his research into prophecy is indicated when Baristan, who knew Rhaegar well, tells Daenerys, One day Prince Rhaegar found something in his scrolls that changed him. No one knows what it might have been, only that the boy suddenly appeared early one morning in the yard as the knights were donning their steel. He walked up to Sir Willem Darry, the master at arms, and said, I will require sword and armour. It seems I must be a warrior. Of course, we can't also help but consider the role dreams may have played in his decisions. Barristan, being one of the most stolidly concrete observers in the series, is far more likely to attribute this apparently forward-looking statement to something tangible like a book or a scroll than to such an intangible and likely unspoken thing as a prophetic dream. In any case, Rhaegar was evidently dialed into whatever prophecy had led to the circumstances of his birth, both his parentage and the inferno that accompanied it. But he also took pains to be a dutiful and valiant prince. It could be that the melancholy that he occasionally displayed, notably when playing his silver-stringed harp, actually made him more attractive as a prince. Certainly his father, with his mistresses and balls early in his reign, never seemed to truly take time to mourn the tragedy at Summerhall or later his own parents' relatively early deaths. That outward display of humanity was left to the crown prince and his reputation was the better for it. In A Dance with Dragons, Barristan, reminiscing about the kings he had served, thinks that Rhaegar would have been a finer king than any of them. And it was almost certainly attitudes like this, during his father's reign, that led to a growing estrangement between Ares and his heir. We saw how harshly Ares dealt with ill and pain and the whispers that Tywin was the real power behind the Iron Throne. His reaction to his son's growing popularity would be less overt, but paranoia grows in the shadows, and Ares, in those days, was becoming consumed by both. The ancient harbour town of Duskendale had been a seat of kings of old in the days of the Hundred Kingdoms. Once the most important port on Blackwater Bay, the town had seen its trade dwindle and its wealth shrink as King's Landing grew and burgeoned, a decline that its young lord, Dennis Darklin, wished to halt. Perhaps the single largest factor contributing to Ares' descent into paranoia, madness, and mistrust of his son was a rebellion in 277 AC by a minor lord that would become known as the Defiance of Duskendale. Once a seat of kings, and even during the Dance of the Dragons still an important port town, Duskendale had dwindled to a backwater, in part due to the favorable reduction of trade tariffs Tywin had granted to the ports at King's Landing, Old Town, and Lannisport. The Darklands of Duskendale had been loyal supporters of House Targaryen since being amongst the first to bend the knee to them during the conquest, but Lord Dennis Darkland wanted a charter for his city that would have granted it a degree of autonomy from the crown in the area of trade, including reduced tariffs and port fees. When the Hand outright refused his request, Lord Darkland devised a plan that in hindsight was sheer madness. We've all heard the old adage about playing with fire, and perhaps Lord Darklin should have considered it before putting his plan into action. It began with him refusing to pay his taxes, after which he invited the king to come to Duskendale personally to hear his case. 
aside from the effrontery of a minor lord summoning the king, the king's paranoia probably would have prevented him from even considering it had Tywin not strongly advised him against accepting. By this time, Aerys's opposition to Tywin was well documented. When Tywin wished to appoint Westermen to positions at court, Aerys refused and appointed men of his own choosing, notably choosing Sir Willem Derry as Master of Arms for the Red Keep over Tywin's brother Tiggett. When Tywin advocated neutrality in a trade war in Essos, Aerys decided he would support Volantis. When Tywin found in favor of House Blackwood in a border dispute with their ancient rivals House Bracken, Aerys intervened and granted the mill in question to the Brackens. Aerys raised port fees over Tywin's objections, and when other lords complained, he blamed Tywin. And notably, when Tywin requested that his son Jaime be given the opportunity to come to King's Landing and squire for Prince Rhaegar, much as he himself had done in his youth, Aerys refused and instead chose squires for Rhaegar from the sons of several of his own supporters, men known to be in opposition to his hand. And so it seems like Ares's next move is almost a foregone conclusion. Ares declared he would go to Duskendale after all, not to discuss matters as Lord Dennis hoped, but to bring the defiant lord to heel. The thing about the inevitability of his decision is that surely even Tywin could have seen it coming. And so, in light of what happened next, the idea that Tywin knew exactly what he was doing in telling his oppositional king what not to do cannot be ignored. As it happened, Ares went to Duskendale with a small escort led by Sir Gawain Gaunt of the King's Guard. Upon his arrival there, the king was seized and most of his escort killed defending him. Lord Dennis sent word that he would hold the king until his demands were met and that Ares would be executed should any attempt be made to storm his castle, the Dunfort. Tywin resolutely ignored the demands of the defiant lord and instead summoned an army supported by naval force and proceeded to blockade the Dunfort on all sides. The siege of Duskendale began with Tywin's demand for, quote, the complete and unconditional surrender of the town and castle and the release of the king. It would continue for half a year while the king languished in the Dunfort's dungeon. The World Book tells us that during this time, quote, the Darklins dared lay hands upon his person, shoving him roughly, stripping him of his royal raiment, even daring to strike him. Lord Dennis apparently hoped that Tywin would relent and offer him more favourable terms, perhaps access to a ship in which to flee Westeros, as is so often the request of hostage takers when things go south. Perhaps Lord Darklin had forgotten or never heard the story of the Reigns and Tarbex, or perhaps he hoped that the threat to the king's life would save him. But Dennis Darklin reckoned without the steely resolve of Tywin Lannister. Lord Tywin delivered Lord Dennis a final demand for surrender. He promised, quote, Should Lord Darklin refuse again, he would take the town by storm and put every man, woman and child within to the sword. When others of the king's advisers objected to this approach, in light of the threats made to kill the king, the record states that Tywin, indicating the crown prince, replied, he may or he may not, but if he does, we have a better king right here. It was then that Barristan Selmy volunteered for what he would one day recall as his finest hour, though the memory, in the harsh light of hindsight, had also become one of bitterness. Tywin granted the king's guard one day to carry out his rescue mission, after which the sack of the town would commence. Barristan scaled the city wall, made his way to the Dunfort in disguise, rescued Ares from the dungeon, and fought his way free of the castle and the town, with his king in tow, in spite of sustaining an arrow wound to the chest. The aftermath of Duskendale may have been the first time in years, and was certainly the last time ever, that Tywin and Ares were of one mind. In a dark mirror of the fate of the defiant Reigns and Tarbex, Ares had House Darklin and their good kin of House Hollard destroyed and attainted, every living member executed except for a child, Dontos Hollard, whose life Barristan begged to be spared. 
But, as the World Book has it, his experience in Duskendale, quote, shattered the king's remaining sanity. In response to the rough treatment he experienced there, Ares now refused to allow anyone to touch him or to approach him with a blade. His hair and fingernails grew long and wild, and he refused to bathe. His cruelties became excessive and his paranoia reigned unchecked. Ares perceived that Tywin had planned to storm Duskendale in spite of the threats to his person and may have heard a whisper about Tywin's remarks about Rhaegar in the lead-up to that assault. He grew more mistrustful of both his hand and his son than ever, convinced that a plot was afoot to kill him to clear the way for Rhaegar to ascend the throne and marry Tywin's daughter. However, in spite of his burgeoning madness and his deep resentment of his son, Ares made Rhaegar's betrothal a matter he attended to personally. Having outright refused Lord Tywin's suggestion in 276 at the tournament celebrating Prince Viserys' birth that Rhaegar be betrothed to his daughter Cersei, but still deeply suspicious that Tywin was seeking a way to achieve the match in spite of his refusal, Ares now chose to send his cousin Stefan Baratheon to Old Volantis to seek out a noble bride for the prince. Many at court whispered that Ares meant to name Stefan as his hand when he returned, some even suggesting that Tywin would be executed for treason. But Stefan's mission was not a success and he never returned. The ship carrying him and his wife foundered in Shipbreaker Bay during a storm as their sons watched from the battlements of Storm's End. Did this tragic event sow the seeds for Robert Baratheon's resentment of his Targaryen cousins? It certainly seems possible, and with Stefan's mission ending so tragically, there would be no Valyrian bride for Rhaegar and no replacement for Tywin. But from this time forward... Ares became convinced that Tywin had contrived somehow to assassinate Lord Stefan and that he himself was the next target. He began refusing to meet with his hand without all seven Kingsguard present. And now let's focus for a moment on a detail of Stefan's mission that isn't often discussed. Stefan was sent to Essos to find, quote, a maid of noble birth from an old Valyrian bloodline. On the face of it, this seems like a reasonable, if somewhat eccentric, undertaking. Until you consider the source, Ares was neither reasonable nor pragmatic. If his wish was simply to avoid seeing Rhaegar married off to Tywin's daughter against his wishes, he surely could have found a suitable bride in Westeros, perhaps from among the families of the many lords who still surrounded him, currying favour and enabling his capricious inclinations. Like his grandfather, Ares could have sought to bind a prominent noble family to the throne and so gain some measure of support. But remember that both Ares and his father had been married to their own sisters, an age-old Targaryen practice that was, according to the author, part of keeping the bloodlines pure so that they could better control their dragons. As the rebirth of dragons was something that concerned Aegon V and possibly his son Jaehaerys greatly, and is almost certainly linked to the prophecies about the prince that was promised, and as Rhaegar had no sister to marry, it seems very likely that Ares wasn't just looking for a wife of high nobility for his son for prestige or the conventional reasons other kings and princes sought out maidens of high birth. Ares, it would seem, placed a high value upon Valyrian blood specifically, which explains his outright rejection of Cersei Lannister as not good enough. And following the failure of Stefan's mission, the selection of Elia Martell, herself a direct descendant of Aegon IV through his daughter Daenerys, as Rhaegar's bride supports this idea. In all of Westeros, it may be that only Elia was of high enough birth and had sufficient Valyrian blood to meet the king's requirements. When Rhaegar's betrothal is discussed, much of the focus is often upon the failure of Stefan's mission and his death, the rejection of Cersei, and the ironic selection of Elia, who had once been considered as a possible match for Jaime Lannister before Tywin rudely rebuffed the idea following Joanna's death. 
By shifting the focus to the search for a specific bloodline, we can see that Ares was possibly as consumed by dreams of dragons as his predecessors had been. But in spite of the personal dramas and paranoias that absorbed Ares, it must be said that his reign was largely a peaceful and prosperous one for Westeros. The Blackfire threat had been dealt with, with apparent finality, in his father's brief reign, and the restless nobility of his grandfather's reign had been, by and large, appeased by changes brought about under Tywin's administration. However, in 278, as paranoia took hold of the king, he learned of the reputation of a Lysini eunuch called Varys, who was making a name for himself as a spy in Pentos and the Free Cities. In A Dance with Dragons, Barristan thinks the rot in King Ares's reign began with Varys. While this is arguably incredibly oversimplified, Ares had proved to be cruel, capricious and paranoid well before he called upon Varys to become his master of whispers. Perhaps we can agree that when Varys arrived in King's Landing, all of the King's worst impulses were put into sharper focus than ever before. The background of Lord Varys, as he became known, is very murky. At some point during a childhood spent with a traveling mummer's troop, Varys was sold to a sorcerer who castrated him and burned his genitals in some type of blood magic ritual, disposing of the boy as so much detritus when he was done. Varys survived to become a small-time thief and later a successful dealer of information in the city of Pentos with his partner, a young sellsword called Illyrio Mopatis. It turns out there are a number of compelling reasons to consider that Varys or Illyrio or both may have had a bloodline somehow connected to House Blackfire or to Targaryens in exile. And we'll encourage you to check out our episode 25, Writ in Blood, for a complete breakdown of the theories. If we allow that Varys has these connections and arrived in King's Landing in 278 with a secret agenda aimed at sabotaging House Targaryen and perhaps completing what the Blackfire claimants had failed to do over several generations of rebellions and invasions, then the final several years of Ares's reign take on an extremely ominous shade. And to be clear, there needn't have been a distinct plan to place a Blackfire claimant upon the throne in those early days. While there may have been, it's also possible that simply sabotaging their old enemies was goal enough in the beginning. Yeah, remember that we suggested earlier in this episode that a sort of shadow campaign of sabotage may have been taking place as far back as during the reign of Ares I, and that the attrition that reduced House Targaryen to a mere three male members by 278, one of whom was arguably lost to madness, may have been only partly the result of bad fortune. In A Storm of Swords, Catelyn Stark tells her son Rob the Blackfire pretenders troubled the Targaryens for five generations, until Barristan the Bold slew the last of them on the Stepstones. This was meant as a caution to Rob about the problems with legitimised bastards, but the statement also has the ominous ring of undue confidence to it. It's easy to imagine the author and any number of his characters in story cackling while rubbing their hands and saying, you thought all the Blackfires were dead, did you? Additionally, we wonder if perhaps these words about Varys from the world book only a man without friends, family or ties in Westeros could be relied upon for the truth, are meant to be secretly ironic. At any rate, Varys entered the scene during Aerys' reign as the primary enabler of the king's paranoia. At the same time, Aerys became fascinated with dragons and dragonfire. In a dark echo of his grandsire's desire for dragons to bring his recalcitrant lords in line, Aerys reckoned that had he been possessed of dragons, Duskendale would never have happened. He began to experiment with hatching dragon eggs from the Targaryen cache on Dragonstone, and when his early efforts failed, he turned to the guild of pyromancers who knew the secrets of wildfire called a close cousin of dragonfire. Wisdom Rossart of the Pyromancers became as much a fixture at court and upon the small council as Varys the Spider. 
the king gave in to an obsession with fire and began to take great delight in burning his political enemies, real or perceived, under the watchful eye of his pyromancers. But we have to believe that the real reason the pyromancers were called upon in the first place was for assistance in hatching the eggs Ares so desperately wanted to see turned into living, fire-breathing dragons. Remember that pyromancers had been involved in Targaryen efforts to resurrect dragons since the reign of Aegon IV, the first generation of dragonless Targaryens. And so, as we approach the final years of Aerys' reign, dreams, the effort to hatch dragons, and blackfires, if we allow that Varys represents that cause, are once again at the forefront of House Targaryen. But unlike in his grandfather's day, the ruling house now possessed less than a handful of members, the king himself, spiraling into madness, the queen, kept a virtual prisoner in the Red Keep, the crown prince, called the last dragon and so very promising as a leader, but not trusted by his own father, and the youngster Viserys, who Barristan Selmy remarks, oft seemed to be his father's son in ways Rhaegar never did. In those years after Duskendale, the king never left the Red Keep. He continued to be deeply mistrustful of his hand, but Tywin remained in office, bringing his daughter, whom he had once wanted to see betrothed to Rhaegar, to court. It may be that he had new plans for her betrothal, perhaps to Prince Viserys when he grew old enough, or perhaps Tywin was simply biding his time since Rhaegar's new wife, Princess Elia of Dawn, was known to be in fragile health. In fact, the birth of the couple's first child, Princess Rhaenys, had left her bedridden for half a year. Jamie wonders in A Storm of Swords if maybe Tywin ghoulishly anticipated her death and meant to keep Cersei in the right place at the right time to catch Rhaegar's eye. Cersei, though, had ideas of her own. After several years at court, her twin came to King's Landing for a visit in 281. Cersei wanted Jaime, newly knighted, to join Aerys's king's guard so he would be near her always. Conveniently, one of the white knights had just died in his sleep, leaving a spot open that Aerys would be looking to fill. While there's no outward indication of foul play, we think there could be a possibility that Cersei had something to do with Sir Harlan Grandison's death. A silken pillow is right out of the Lannister playbook, and in A Feast for Crows, When contemplating how to rid herself of Marjorie Tyrell, Cersei thinks, When an old man died in his sleep, no one thought twice of it, but a girl of six and ten found dead in bed was certain to raise awkward questions. However Sir Harlan died, it seems clear that Cersei somehow planted the idea of Jaime joining the Kingsguard in Aerys' mind. Yet she reckoned, without her father's long patience with the king, coming to an end at last. For when Ares, clearly delighted at the opportunity to wound his old friend, named Jaime to the white, stripping the hand of his heir and shattering Jaime's planned betrothal with Liza Tully in one blow, Tywin managed to thank the king for the honour, before pleading illness and begging Ares to accept his resignation so he could retire to Castle Rock. Ares agreed and Tywin departed, taking Cersei with him. Her plan, if indeed it was hers, had backfired and she and Jaime would spend the next several years apart. From this time forth, Ares was fully surrounded by what the world book calls Lickspittle Lords, chief amongst them Lord Owen Merriweather, who replaced Tywin as Hand. In addition, the divide between Ares and his son Rhaegar grew so deep that factions inevitably grew up around them at court. Many suspected that Rhaegar wanted to see his father abdicate, or at least retire, leaving him as regent. Surely, given the king's precarious mental health, this would have been a sensible thing to consider, but the Lickspittle lords were accustomed to benefiting from their associations with Ares, something that would not be expected to continue if Rhaegar came to power. These factions became so entrenched that Pycelle wrote to the Citadel that the situation at the Red Keep was as tense as any since the lead-up to the Dance of the Dragons 150 years earlier. Much like his ancestor, Princess Rhaenyra, 
Rhaegar and his wife kept mainly to Dragonstone, where he was attended by his close friends and certain members of the Kingsguard, ostensibly to keep Tywin from acting upon his nefarious assassination plots. Aerys kept Jaime Lannister at his side, where the young knight would eventually witness some of his king's most savage and inhumane acts, the deaths by burning of Lord Chelstead and of Rickard and Brandon Stark, the rape of Queen Rhaella, and the king's secret campaign to mine the capital city with wildfire caches. The background of these events were the events of the Year of the False Spring the tourney at Harrenhal, and the flashpoint of the rebellion of Lord Robert Baratheon, the supposed abduction of Lyanna Stark by the Crown Prince. These are events that will soon be covered in a dedicated episode, and so we're going to keep our focus on where prophecy came back into the equation for the royal family in the course of that year. Given the nature of Ares and Rhaella's marriage and Rhaegar's birth, perhaps it's fair to say that prophecy was never not in the equation for the Prince of Dragonstone. Maester Aemon remarks to Sam Tarly in A Feast for Crows that at one point both he and Rhaegar believed, based upon the wording of a specific prophecy and the predictions of the ghost of High Heart, that the prince who was promised was Rhaegar himself. But, quote, later he became persuaded that it was his own son who fulfilled the prophecy, for a comet had been seen above King's Landing on the night Aegon was conceived, and Rhaegar was certain the bleeding star had to be a comet. And indeed, in A Clash of Kings, Daenerys has a vision in the House of the Undying in Carth of her brother Rhaegar in a room with his wife and newborn son. Will you make a song for him? the woman asked. He has a song, the man replied. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. He looked up when he said it, and his eyes met Danny's, and it seemed as if he saw her standing there beyond the door. There must be one more, he said, though whether he was speaking to her or the woman in the bed, she could not say. The dragon has three heads. It seems clear from Danny's vision that Rhaegar had some sort of epiphany at this moment. It seemed as if he saw her, it says, after which he declared, there must be one more. The dragon has three heads. And we know from the World Book that very shortly after the events described in this vision, Rhaegar disappeared into the Riverlands with a group of friends, only to next be seen making off with the daughter of Lord Rickard Stark of Winterfell. Without diving too far into the backstory of Rhaegar's association with Lyanna Stark, we can say that it's our belief that this abduction was actually a rescue of sorts, that Lyanna had inadvertently fallen afoul of Ares, now known throughout the realm as the Mad King, and that the prince sought to protect her. What followed, the deaths of her brother and father and a number of their companions and bannermen, led directly to the civil war known as Robert's Rebellion. But many believe that Rhaegar was also driven by prophecy that something had led him to a new understanding of words he had once thought described his own destiny, and later, his son Aegon's. While it seems clear that prophecy and a sense of destiny are what motivated Rhaegar, paranoia remained the strongest motivating factor for his father. The events of the tourney at Harrenhal had done nothing to assuage Ares' suspicions of his son, but the arrival of Lyanna's brother Brandon at the Red Keep, shouting for Rhaegar to come out and die, was all the Mad King needed to turn his fevered attention to a new target. Ares managed to give in to his most savage impulses and shatter the feudal contract of Lord and King in a single blow when he burned Lord Rickard Stark alive while his eldest son strangled himself trying to stop it. Rhaegar was no longer the enemy, and war with his lords was now inevitable. Ares no longer seemed to care, if he ever had, about the prophecy that had driven his son's entire existence, but he still may have been very interested in hatching dragons. As the walls closed in and the rebels gained more support and more victories, Ares gave the city of King's Landing into the hands of his pyromancers. After Rhaegar's death at the Battle of the Trident, Ares sent Rhaella and Viserys to Dragonstone, but kept Rhaegar's wife and children by his side to keep Dorne's army loyal. 
Jamie recalls the king's words as the rebel army closed in on the capital. The traitors want my city, I heard him tell Rosart, but I'll give them naught but ashes. Let Robert be king over charred bones and cooked meat. Jamie continues the story with, The Targaryens never bury their dead. They burn them. Ares meant to have the greatest funeral pyre of them all. Though, if truth be told, I do not believe he truly expected to die. Like Ari on bright fire before him, Ares thought the fire would transform him, that he would rise again, reborn as a dragon, and turn all his enemies to ash. And so, at this point in his life, it seems highly likely that Ares was experiencing dragon dreams quite similar to those of his great-uncle Arion. A dragon would be born from the flames, a literal apotheosis that would give the king a final victory over his enemies. Though, failing that, he had built in the failsafe of turning his city into an inferno a thousand times bigger than the one that had consumed Summerhall on the day of Rhaegar's birth. It was an all-or-nothing plan, born from his madness and paranoia, but also, given what we know about Targaryen dreaming, highly likely to have been also influenced by dragon dreams of some sort. It must be said that 15 years later, an as-yet-unborn daughter of Ares and Rhaella would hatch not one but three dragons from a funeral pyre, and that she herself would walk out of the flames unharmed, much as Jamie suspected her father had believed he would. Given the timeline of Daenerys' conception, which also syncs up with Jon Snow's birth, we have to wonder how much of his dreaming may have been prophetic or at least anticipatory in nature. If he dreamed a dragon coming forth from a funeral pyre, perhaps it was his daughter's life he saw. Perhaps he dreamed a dragon being born, and, much as we've speculated that Rhaegar's birth was the event Aegon V may have dreamt about, it was simply the birth of Rhaegar's unknown and posthumous son in the Red Mountains of Dawn. Whatever births Ares may have been dreaming about, his own life and reign were nearing their conclusion. As we've said, following the death of his heir at the decisive battle at the Trident, Ares sent his wife and younger son to Dragonstone for safekeeping, while holding Rhaegar's family in King's Landing to ensure that the remains of the Dornish army, which had suffered heavy losses at the Trident, remained faithful to him. In keeping Jamie Lannister by his side, even as his son led the royal army into the Riverlands, accompanied by three of his Kingsguard, Ares had thought to keep Tywin Lannister loyal as well. And in fact, Tywin had notably stayed out of the fray during all the significant events from the tourney at Harrenhal throughout the rebellion up until this point. And so when he appeared at the gates of King's Landing with an army of Westermen, Ares assumed his old friend had come to rescue him. Lord Varys advised him not to open the gates, likely wanting to preserve the chaos of Ares's reign for the benefit of whatever plots he had in motion, and perhaps more importantly, to not cede any power to Lord Tywin. However, the king listened to the advice of Grand Maester Pycelle and had the gates thrown open. And so the sack of King's Landing began, with the Westermen pouring into the city and soon breaching the Red Keep itself. As they sought out the king, Princess Elia and her children were murdered by Tywin's henchmen. Years later, it will be implicitly confirmed that the murder of the children, at least, was done on Tywin's orders. And Ares still thought to use Jaime against his father. He sent a message commanding the young king's guard to prove his loyalty by bringing him Tywin's head, perhaps knowing that Jaime wouldn't act upon this order, but hoping it would bring Tywin to heel. The message also included the chilling detail that Lord Rossart was with the king. Now, Jaime had known for some time about the pyromancer's work, mining the city with wildfire caches and he knew the king intended to set it off as a last resort to prevent King's Landing from falling into rebel hands. The significance of Rossart's presence in the Red Keep wasn't lost on him, and so he set out to stop the plot by killing Rossart, after which he went to the throne room and killed the king himself. He tells Brienne in A Storm of Swords that days later he killed the rest of the pyromancers as well, for good measure. 
And so ended the reign of Ares II. The irony that he was killed by the young knight he had insisted on keeping at his side to ensure his own safety from Tywin should be lost on none of us. Nor should the fact that Jamie only learned the details of the plot that led him to take the drastic measure of killing his king because Ares refused to let him be out of his company. Ares would be known to history not as Ares the Great or Ares the Wise, as he had once hoped, but rather as the Mad King. Though his own reign was arguably more peaceful and prosperous than those of his father and grandfather, it ended in blood, if not in fire, thanks to the actions of Jaime Lannister. And as in his predecessor's reigns, the through lines of dragons, dreams, prophecy, and possibly even the Blackfire issue were all present by the end. As for his legacy, the reign of Ares II ostensibly brought about the death of the Targaryen dynasty. The new king would be a Baratheon, a close cousin, but one who claimed the succession by right of conquest rather than blood, and the next two decades of Westerosi politics would be dominated, once again, by Tywin Lannister. Ares had three children. Rhaegar, who predeceased his father, perishing at the trident, his visions of a prophetic destiny unfulfilled and misunderstood, as much a victim of his father's madness as anyone. Viserys, whose instability and alarming similarities to his father would become more and more obvious over the course of a 15-year exile, until a serious error in judgment led to his death in the Dothraki Sea. And lastly, Daenerys, the posthumous daughter who will hatch three dragon eggs from her husband's funeral pyre. And then there are the grandchildren, Rhaenys and Aegon, both dead at the hands of Lannister swords. Or is it possible that Aegon survived? And finally, the apparent prince in hiding, Jon Snow, the posthumous son of Rhaegar and Lyanna Stark, whose destiny may be linked to the song of ice and fire that Rhaegar once thought belonged to his firstborn son, Aegon. And so on the surface, while at the moment of Ares' death it appeared that generations of dreams of dragons and prophecies about their return and about the destiny of princes came to nothing, especially the ghost of High Heart's words about the promised prince coming from Ares and Rhaella's line, it turns out that the Targaryen bloodline is still very much alive and could be destined to play a major role in the forthcoming struggle we expect to be the climax of A Song of Ice and Fire. Daenerys has hatched her dragons, and while we cannot say for sure if the marriages of her parents and grandparents played a direct role in that, we can certainly speculate that it might have, given the author's clarity about the value of a pure bloodline in controlling dragons. As far as the promised prince, both Daenerys and Jon are possible candidates, and if Aegon turned out to be the real thing, then so would he be as well. In spite of the fact that in 283, House Targaryen seemed to be finished, at the dawn of the 4th century, it's about to become obvious that they are still very much alive and relevant. It's not a new observation that in A Song of Ice and Fire, the present is informed by the past. The histories that we have of House Targaryen in the 3rd century are quite valuable in showing us not only how various characters came to be who or what they are, but also in revealing themes we can expect to be relevant in the present. Prophecies and dreams, dragons and blackfires, are all things we continue to discuss in the context of the main series and the lives of those who came before play a key role in illuminating their importance. It all goes back and back to our mothers and fathers and theirs before them. We are puppets dancing on the strings of those who came before us. And one day, our own children will take up our strings and dance on in our steads. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode all about dreams and prophecies and the reigns of the last three Targaryen kings. We'll be back soon with a new episode all about Prince Oberyn Martell. And now, as always, it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. 
Thanks to George R. R. Martin for including so much rich history and world building in A Song of Ice and Fire. And thanks to Kevin McLeod and Kai Angle for allowing us to use their music in our production. And as usual, we'll end today with thanks to our patrons from the Castle Steel level. If you enjoy the podcast, consider being a patron and you could be hearing your name here too. Sincere thanks to AJ, Egg on the Sixth, Alex, Allie B, Allie C, Amber, Oakenfist, Bran the Builder, Brian, Camille, Casey, Charitable Rereadings, Chris, Christian, Christine, Maddie and Jessica, Sir Duncan Cole, Convenience or Death, Sir Archibald Cadogan, Dan S, Dimitri B, Dennis, Direwolf, Esme, Liz, Emily of the Erie, Ezra, Felix, Sir Gladworth, Greg, History of Westeros, Engvild, Archmaester Kobe of the Higher Mysteries, Brendan B. Fish, Goldie Juke, Jim McGeehan, Winter's King, John Aris, Rider of the Ice Dragon, Sonarion, The White Storm, Julie Beth of Tarth, Judson, Archmaester June, Healer of the Lesser Poxes, Catherine, Lady Kelly, Mistress of the Old Bay of Crabs, Brash Candy, Tree Girl, Sir Galahoo of What, Knight of the Laughing Tree, Lena Snow, known as the Twilight Star, Lemba, Lemmy B, Liam, Luke, Monaro Geek TV, Maria, Margareta, and our cohort of Matts, Matt A, Matt C, Matt K, Matt L, and Lady Beatrix of House Grey, Maester Mary, Michael M, Mitchell, anime lover Nicole, Nimble Nick One Eirik, Patrick, Peter Pebble, PJ, Philip, Paul B, Paul H, Richard, Sam, Sarah, Scott Greenseer, Sir Daniel the Sneaky Russian, Sir Swift the Peppered Knight from the House of Black and Grey, Sherry, Cern, Terry, Sir Terence, Knight of the Cedars, Theo the Cannibal of Casterly Rock, Hama Helmet, the Sellsword Sentinel, Virginie, Corin Halfhand, and Yvonne. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, if you have a nickname you'd prefer to use, or if you feel we've left anything out. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access to all our podcasts. You can also find a link to our Patreon campaign, donate via PayPal or Coffee, and comment on our content there. Or find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. And of course, you can connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or email. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon with a new episode. Bye for now.